Thank you for joining us today for Informed Consent, What Did I Agree To? We hope to have an interactive discussion on a topic that affects each of us. During the webinar, you may submit questions in the Dropbox, and at the end of the webinar, we will open the lines for questions. Please keep background noises to a minimum. Today's presenters are Donald Akers, Jr. and Janelle Johnson Momani. Donald Akers is General Counsel at the Hemophilia Federation of America, and he serves pro bono. He has done so cheerfully for over 15 years. Donald lives in Louisiana, where he works as an Assistant District Attorney with the Elderly Protective Services and Family Services Division. I am Janelle Johnson Momani, and I'm an Advocacy Manager in the DC Office of the Hemophilia Federation of America. Let us begin. Thanks, Janelle. Um, today's topic, informed consent, is quite important, and I want to start off by uh, telling you a little bit about my little buddy whose picture you see there with me. Uh, I'm happy to be with him, and he looks a little traumatized, uh, and he didn't do that <laughs> specifically because it was his I'm first sure emergency room visit. <laughs> but <not> anyhow, <laughs> he's, a, he's a cutie pie. What happened is, is that uh, while speaking at one of our HFA member organizations' annual meetings, uh, I heard the story of a young family who were newcomers to the community, and uh, their difficulty with their first ER visit saddened me because it was so similar to the many such stories that I've heard over the years. Treatment of those with bleeding disorders in our ERs uh, across America continues to be difficult, and the negative experiences for so many leads to potential harm as well. So hopefully this presentation will give you some ammunition and some empowerment when you're faced with these situations. This is my little buddy's story. His mom and dad were happy when he was born to them. He was their second son and had been born the previous year when I heard their story. Two days after his birth, he was circumcised and uh, as some people experienced, uncontrollable bleeding followed. Uh, it was at that point that a diagnosis of severe hemophilia A was made and there had been no prior family histories on either parent's side, so he was one of our spontaneous uh, births as we're experiencing more frequently these days. Immediately when they returned home from the hospital after things settled down, they made their appointment with the local HTC and their edu educational process began. Shortly after that HTC visit, they received uh, the baby's treatment plan uh, in the mail and he experienced, as it would happen, his first bleed in his bicep on that same day. And the bleed occurred where he had had blood drawn that week before. So as instructed, they called the local HTC in their state and the hematologist on call directed them to the ER in their local area and you know, had them bring their treatment plan in hand. So armed with their information, their plan, uh, they knew that they may have to inform potentially unknowing medical personnel about this baby's condition and the proper treatment as they had been instructed. They get to the emergency room, the admitting nurse was advised if the baby's diagnosis and shown the treatment plan. And as taught, they advised the nurse that it was best to infuse the baby before there were any tests done. The treatment plan was shown and the same request about infusion prior to testing to the next nurse who came in the triage process and then the resident physician who came and then the attending physician was also given the same information. They also advised all of these people that there were two clotting factors which were third generation factors that had been prescribed for this baby's use, and they gave them the brand names. The treatment plan was taken, supposedly, by the nurses to be scanned into the baby's medical record at the hospital for that day and for future use in the event, and of course, and expected that he would be perhaps seeing this hospital staff again. Although it appeared to the parents that the ER staff had not dealt with hemophilia patients previously, which is something that we seem to experience. The parents witnessed the doctors and nurses call a hematologist over the phone, and the conversation led to them observing a nurse come to photograph the child's bleed area uh, with a cell phone, and that was apparently transmitted over the internet to the hematologist. Uh, an ER nurse insisted at that time upon starting an IV and getting it ready for an infusion, but the parents knowingly and as instructed and empowered, 
convinced the nurse that an IV was not appropriate for the infusion, but that a butterfly needle was the better practice as the parents had been advised shortly before by their HTC. So approximately two hours later, a clear syringe arrived, loaded with factor, and the baby was infused. The parents, as instructed by the HTC in their education, had been advised to log all infusions in a logbook. So they asked the nurse which of the two prescribed factors had been used. Was it Advate or Zintha as directed in the treatment plan? The nurse went and located the box in the vial and advised the parents that neither had been infused, but that instead humate P had been infused, not a prescribed factor for this child. The parents immediately knew that this product was not prescribed, and they shortly learned from the ER staff that although the hospital pharmacy had Advate and Zintha in stock, those were not the ones that were sent down from the pharmacy to the emergency room. When they got home, they were troubled about this experience and were concerned about the improper or not prescribed factor. And certainly, uh, understandably, they went to the hospital shortly thereafter to obtain the copies of the child's medical records from that ER visit to see what breakdown in communication and treatment had occurred and so that they could prepare for any future visits to the ER. The parents advised their HTC of what happened. And with the help of their HTC, the HTC determined that the ER doctor placed an order for a factor eight drug, and the pharmacy dispensed the first brand on the list that they had on their computer, which was not the brand prescribed, even though they had it. A little systems communication failure, medical problem in dispensing. The family also learned that despite being advised of the treatment plan, being scanned into the permanent record for their child, that did not happen as well uh, when they were trying to see what had been prescribed by the HTC. And they learned that a paper copy was instead being held in an ER file for future use. This also concerned them as it did not allow for them to access or update in a central file, which would be available to other medical people and the hospital's pharmacy necessarily if something happened in the future. So everything being said, what did the parents do right? One would think everything. They followed all the rules. But they did fail to do one thing. And amazingly, as new parents with no experience, they did a great job. But their failure was not stopping the nurse prior to the infusion of that clear syringe. They didn't stop her before the infusion and demand to see the box and the vial of factor that was being prepared to infuse their child. That would have been appropriate. It is what they should have done, and it was within their rights. They had the right to stop or to refuse that medical treatment at that time and call a halt to the proceedings to prevent the error. Ultimately, I'm happy to report that he's a healthy, happy, and beautiful child, as I saw him when this photograph was taken at HFA's 2012 symposium in Santa Clara, the family came at my invitation and suggestion, and uh, they had a wonderful experience and learned so much being with all of the rest of the community. So with that said, it's the tone for why we need to know about informed consent and what our rights are. Next, Janelle. Now, Donnie, do you think most parents would have felt comfortable um, requesting to see the box of the factor that was going to be used on their child? Probably seasoned parents with hemophilia, you know, in their families and a lot of experience would have felt comfortable, even though it's difficult to try to question medical professionals because medical professionals oftentimes do not invite that participation. It's more likely that parents in a situation like this young couple new to the community with a new diagnosis would not have, you know, so I don't blame them for not asking. It, it, it's almost expected that they wouldn't have asked. We take their story to try to let people know that you have the right to and you should stop, ask questions along the way. Okay. Okay. So with that, basically, these are pretty much what your rights in the ER are. You have the right to be informed about your health status. It's not the doctor's status. It's not the hospital's status. It's your status. You have the right to be involved in your care, the care plan, the treatment plan. And you have the right to request treatment, 
or important, more importantly, perhaps, to refuse treatment. So, you know, basically, informed consent is the process in the hospital so that you are given the information and disclosures that you need to make an informed decision. You always have a say. You have a right. Next, Janelle. What is informed consent? Informed consent, basically, it's a process. It's not just a form. How many of us have been, you know, in a medical setting where you got a clerk or somebody who comes to you with a bunch of paper, usually attached to a clipboard or something, or now with iPads, et cetera, and they have a new sign here, initial here, turn this over, sign here, do you have a living will? Is this on file? You get all these questions, you know, from that. I can definitely say I've, I've experienced that. Absolutely. Then they, you know, stick out your arm. They're going to put a band on you. What is your date of birth? What is your name? You know, and it's just this whole process. They do it rotely. They do it blindly. They do it a hundred times a day. They basically just go through their process. But their process is not the process that informed consent requires. It's not just these forms and this automatic pilot communication. Informed consent basically serves as the basis for a contract between the patient and the doctor or the healthcare provider. It includes communication between the patient and the physician, results in the patient either agreeing to or refusing treatment. And it needs to be the doctor or in a clinical trial or research situation, the researcher, not the administrative staff, not the ward clerk, not the whomever you see at the desk who's taking all this stuff and sticking the band on your wrist to tell you about why, what is going on. And why is that? Because these people are not the trained medical professionals. They're not the ones who are, who are supposed to have the knowledge about the actual medical treatment and who are going to have the knowledge about what the risks and the benefits and those things that you need to know about diagnosis. A ward clerk or someone else who is not a medical professional, you know, like the doctor or the researcher, is not going to know about your diagnosis be able to discuss and answer your questions sufficiently. They're not the ones who can talk to you in talking about this throughout the country. Uh, some people have said, you know, when we've refused treatment, because we've kind of been in the situation where we knew these people knew nothing or we were concerned about, you know, more harm than good, they've been told by a nurse or a ward clerk or someone in patient intake that if they refuse or they leave AMA, which I understand means against medical advice, they've been told that their insurance company would not pay the bill. And my advice to them always is, is that insurance companies have a habit of not wanting to pay bills anyhow, and they certainly would never have a problem not paying a bill for services that you didn't have because you refuse to have them. And any okay. hospital that will bill for, you know, services that did not happen is going to have a whole bunch of other problems going on. So don't ever let any kind of threat or coercion make you consent to something when you really haven't fulfilled all of the, you know, questions and answers and communication that you need. Okay. Next. Uh, in Louisiana, where I practice law uh, and doing research for these presentations, I learned something. Uh, and what I learned was that we have a Louisiana Supreme Court decision regarding what is sufficient for informed consent. And of course, this happened because a medical malpractice suit was filed because something went wrong. And when something goes wrong, people look to see why it went wrong. And apparently in this case, one of the uh, circumstances being examined as to whether or not there was wrongdoing was whether or not there had been informed consent in the process between the patient and their physician. And the Louisiana Supreme Court in that case pretty much gave us some definitions and some parameters as to what has to happen. And they said the doctor has a duty to disclose all material risks of proposed treatment. So what is material risk? They actually defined it. They said, what is, you know, the question is whether a reasonable patient, in our case a reasonable person with a bleeding disorder, in the setting where they need treatment for that, would have consented, had material information and risks been disclosed about that procedure or treatment. 
our Supreme Court in Louisiana said the doctor is required to disclose the risks that are reasonably foreseeable. The doctor is not required to disclose risks that are commonly understood, obvious, or already known to the patient. I mean, there's some things they don't have to just go through a whole checklist of whatever, but what is material. And in Louisiana, I learned uh, that we have a right to privacy in our state constitution, which specifically says that we have the right to decide whether to obtain or reject medical treatment. So in my state, uh, despite many things that you've heard about us, we have a constitutional right to refuse medical treatment. So that in mind, um, we're going to talk about a couple of the other states uh, that I've done some research in when I presented in those states. Next, uh, Janelle. Now let's do a quick quiz. Does the doctor have to tell you the needle prick will hurt when you infuse? Um, I would say no, because probably uh, you've been stuck with enough needles and you know that it hurts. And, uh, you know, whenever I'm having blood drawn and they tell me it's going to be like a mosquito bite or something like that, you know, I always <laughs> laugh. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Mosquitoes are probably not uh, going to hurt as much. But nonetheless, that is something that you know about, you've experienced. That is not a material risk or a material information uh, to be disclosed to you. Okay. Does the doctor have to inform you that inhibitors are a risk when you use clotting factor? No, I would suggest that yes, because uh, this is material, as so many people who have experienced inhibitors uh, in the community know, and that when you're going to be put on a new factor or a factor product for the first time, or if you're going to be changing products, definitely I think it's material information and a material risk that needs to be advised to the patient uh, when such is happening. So yeah, I think that would fall into the material risk uh, disclosure. Okay. Another question. Is informed consent available at every medical facility? Hmm. Well, that's a broad question, and I guess the answer to the question in that sense is is that um, informed consent is required at every medical facility when you're going to be having a procedure or treatment, unless of course it's an emergency or such. But in our community, particularly for the hemophilia community, informed consent for hemophilia and bleeding disorders treatment, you know, is sadly we know very well not available at every medical facility because so many medical facilities and ERs and others who are not HTCs and, you know, accustomed to and treat hemophilia patients, they don't have the knowledge and information. So um, I think a good question to ask is when you go to a place that's not your HTC and not regularly treating hemophilia patients, you might want to ask them, are you familiar with hemophilia? You know, when they twist their lips and they shake their head and they take a little while and they tell you, know, which they should if they don't know, then probably okay. you know more than them, and I would suggest that possibly informed consent may not be possible depending upon what treatment is being suggested and how the process is being handled. Okay. Next. In Idaho, where I presented uh, once, uh, I want to, wanted to and do actually research the laws uh, specific to informed consent in the various states. Uh, so that I can give my audience a little bit more particular information. And in Idaho, when I spoke there, I'd learned that informed consent under their statutory uh, provisions does not require any specific form. It can be oral or verbal. But in, in any kind of oral or verbal approval or situation or contract, you have to prove that the conversation was had so that you can prove that there was consent. Uh, their statutes say that a written consent that is signed or initialed by a person is presumed valid unless or absent proof of malice or fraud. So I guess in a situation in Idaho, if you go in there and the ward clerk or the whomever, you know, gave you all this paper, as I just described, and said initial here, sign here, yada, 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 stick your hand out, put the band on, that's going to be considered or presumed valid. But when you get into the, you know, the details of what happened, if there's uh, unfortunately something that went awry later on, that then may not be uh, presumed valid, even though it doesn't rise to malice or fraud, probably you'd have other standards of care that would come into place, perhaps the American Medical Association's 
uh, the hospital's own uh, informed consent rules come into play to determine. Idaho also says that consent or refusal for medical treatment is valid, uh, valid if the person is sufficiently aware of pertinent facts about the nature of and the significant risks so as to make a reasonably informed decision. This is similar to the material risk uh, in the Louisiana Supreme Court decision. It's just a different way of saying the same thing. All of these things in all of these states, this conversation, this questioning, this consent, this refusal, all of these things are recipes that are necessary to come up with the final product of informed consent, that contract between the health care provider, the physician, and the patient. Next. Oh, and it's some additional considerations for informed consent. Um, what we've talked about, you know, before now it has been pretty much in the general regular medical sen uh, setting in uh, HDCs, ERs, hospital settings, doctors. But what about when you're going to be talking about uh, maybe participating in a research setting or a clinical trial, or perhaps when someone is trying to, uh, you know, suggest to you or recommend that you might want to participate in such. A couple of little, you know, additional things that you might want to look into. First off, you are a human subject in these things. Uh, you're a participant as opposed to, you know, being a patient. And, you know, you should have all of your questions answered before you consent. You should have known about the possibility for joining or entering to a clinical trial or research setting previously so that you've perhaps done some research, used the internet, come up with the questions. You shouldn't be doing this and then being expected to sign on the dotted line, you know, at the first visit or at the doctor's visit or whatever. That just doesn't seem to be, you know, necessarily appropriate. And uh, you should also know that once you do, if you do consent to a clinical trial, you always have the right to withdraw your consent at any time. So you should ask questions. What are the risks? What happens to the information and the data that this research setting or clinical trial is going to collect? How are you going to store it? And uh, who's going to have access to my information? And um, basically, you need to be the person who's driving whether or not you ultimately consent. It's about now, you. you should you agree to sign up for a research study right away? No, absolutely not. I think that you should either have known in advance that you were going to be speaking to someone about it because you were told about it and you did some homework and some preparation. And in the, under those circumstances, if you you know have that information and you ask the questions and are sufficiently provided with information, you might do it then. But if you just happen to go to your regular appointment and it's in the regular course and scope of your medical treatment and you're just... Uh, you know, all of a sudden say, oh, by the way, we have this uh, research or clinical trial that we're, you know, trying to get people to do. Well, let me tell you a little bit about it, and, you know, we'd like to sign you up today. I don't know if I would, you know, recommend that you do it. You certainly don't have to, and it probably wouldn't be prudent. You should take some time to do your homework. And what's the difference between, I see the slide, it says, you are the human subject or participant. Well, because you're not... Say participant. Yeah, you're you're human, and you're the subject of the clinical trial, or you're the subject of the research. Uh, so yeah, you're okay. you're not necessarily a patient because it's, I think in most research or clinical trials, you're not necessarily being treated in the ordinary course and scope of a doctor-patient situation, because uh, you know research and clinical trials, although they're related and may have some of the same nuances, they're also different. So I think I think that this is the general term of art in clinical trials. You know your subjects or participants is how you're called. Okay. So all of your questions should be answered before you consent. Oh, always. If, if all of your questions are not answered in any circumstance, you should not consent. And how does one withdraw consent? If you decide that you no longer want to participate. Now, well, the I... Go ahead. The first thing I would do is to verbalize it. You know, I don't want to do this anymore. I, you know, you will not infuse me. You will not do this. You will not do that. I'm not going to allow you to do this. And then, if you meet with any resistance, you may want to memorialize it with an email, or some type of letter, or note something that you can go back to, and it can be proven. Should there be any, you know, controversy or conflict, uh, or or difference in who 
recalls what and all. So I would say that you should document it. Uh, perhaps they would have a form in that clinical trial or research setting uh, for persons who are going to withdraw consent and withdraw from the project to sign. That would be expected. But if not, then you know you want to make sure that you first you know let them know, memorialize it in writing, and it, simply you just. If you don't want to do it, you don't do it. And if you don't show up and you don't allow it, that's, you know, you, you okay. should be penalized for that. And I know most research projects, at least, I, I believe they're required to have a principal investigator. And by letting the principal investigator know that's the person who's responsible for the entire study, if you let them know that you no longer want to participate, um, as you say, memorialize it, put it in writing so it lasts forever. Um, yes. That's the reason for that, right? Um, then um, they would definitely have an obligation to respect your um, decision. Well, the informed consent process also should have included instruction as to how you can withdraw and who you go to and what the process is. That's all part okay. of the information that needs to be given to you for the informed consent. They can't just skip over that and not tell you about how you can withdraw. That is material to the whole process. Okay, okay. Let's do a quick quiz. Who owns your medical records? Well, the law from my research in the different states that I uh, speak at has showed me that in many states uh, the laws are different, but I'm finding that in Louisiana, Florida, Idaho, Iowa, and I think if I remember correctly, California, the doctor or the health care provider or the hospital or the HTC they own your medical records. Most people are surprised at that, but they own your medical records, not you. Okay, that is surprising. And are your rec are they your records, or are they just records about you? Well, um, yeah. They are not your records. They are the doctor, hospital, HTC, healthcare providers records, as I just said. But they are records about you. And okay. uh, they control them, but you have, uh, in the states that I have looked at, you always have a right to copies. You have a right to copies at a reasonable cost, not exorbitant cost, and within a reasonable time. In fact, uh, I think it's a good practice, and I have actually started doing this in my own health care. I get copies of all of my blood work and other test results, uh, and I keep them in a file of my own, and I started to bring all of those with me, especially as you see different uh, specialists in different fields. Uh, it's always good to have everything because you avoid duplication, redundancy, you know, testing for the same thing when it's just been done. It's just a good practice to get those copies as they're generated, as those records are generated. And you have a right to them. Great. Next. Uh, again, just as a caveat to everything, unless it's a genuine emergency situation in all research, in all health care, you know, emergencies, you know, trump anything, uh, and that's a medical call. So unless it's an emergency, patients and research participants are entitled to complete information on all of the treatments or procedures to which they are subject. And that's what we're trying to stress to you today. You have the right to the conversation, to the information, to the process before you say yes or no. And the healthcare providers, doctors, hospitals, HTCs, they want to do it as well because ultimately when they don't and there's a problem, it leads to legal liability and legal liability leads to money cost to them, it leads to harm and damage to patients and their families. So ultimately, it's a win-win situation for everybody when it's all done correctly. You know, just remember that it's your right and you have a say. Ask questions. You are always your best advocate. Don't expect someone else to be your advocate because nobody can do it better than you. And if you need more information on informed consent, I would suggest that you go to this website. It's the American Medical Association's website. And they have, if you just uh, type in their search box, informed consent, you're going to get 
all conversation, and they actually issue opinions in various settings regarding research and you know emergency room situations. People have written, doctors have written, hospitals have written with questions as to how this is to be handled. I find it to be a really, really good resource. Great. Now, this webinar, along with other resources on informed consent, will be available on the Hemophilia Federation of America website. We will have a toolkit available for you to download great tips on remembering what to ask regarding informed consent. Thank you all for joining us today, and we will now open up the lines for questions. Again, please limit background noises so we can hear each question clearly. All right, great. Someone submitted a question. You may also submit a question in writing. You can do so in the top corner of the drop box. You can also, um, if you raise your hand, there's a raise your hand option. You can also ask a question directly to the panelist. All right, first question. Are there any standards of care that apply specifically to hemophilia patients in the ER? That's a good question. And actually, uh, I'm proud to say that HFA uh, was a real proponent of trying to get the standards of care for hemophilia treatment and hemophilia triage in emergency rooms uh, changed to reflect reality because of all of these types of uh, stories and experiences. And uh, I remember meeting uh, with a group from the hemophilia community on behalf of HFA with the president of the American College of Emergency Physicians who were interested in you know, doing some things to change to, for example, allow patients to go against the standard uh, hospital ER policies to allow the infusion of your own factor in the emergency room because, as we all know, many hospitals don't carry factor. It's expensive. It expires. The cost of them is too great. They don't see enough of a patient load to justify it. So that's an issue that we always saw. And there were other things uh, that needed to be you know, changed or were recommended to be changed. But ultimately, that did not happen, and we've learned that uh, ERs decided that it's their job to stabilize people and to ship them off to the appropriate specialist in that area. They don't establish a patient relationship. They don't have a follow-up visit and all these kind of things. Their role, as I've learned, is get them in, assess them, stabilize, you know, keep them alive, and get them to the appropriate sponsor. So uh, sadly, uh, ER triage standards for hemophilia are treated no differently than ER standards in triage situations for all types of other uh, illnesses and disease states. You are we had, who knows. We had a question have. come in um, related to factor, and maybe you can, um, you know, continue sure. in this line. Um, what are your options when you ask questions and then ultimately make a decision that goes against the doctor's advice? regarding your factor choice. Uh, if you're in an ER setting or whatever, like what happened here when they basically, and if they had known, they could have stopped the infusion of humate P into the, my little buddy instead of uh, Zympha or Advate, uh, your choice is to say no. You will not okay. do this. We will not allow you to do this. I mean, that is your right. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing illegal about it. In fact, uh, you know, they even though to, Even though it was the doctor's? suggestion for that particular medication? The patient, and in this case the patient's parents, because he's a baby, you know, have the right to refuse medical treatment on his behalf, and that includes refusal to allow them to infuse a prescription that is not that which is prescribed, a drug that is not which is, which is prescribed by the experts, by his hemophilia treatment center specialist. Okay. I mean, they, okay. they, they may, you know, the medical people may, you know, think, you know, well, we know better, and how dare you question us or tell us what to do? You didn't go to school. You don't have the license. Well, I would tell you, I would tell them, you know nothing about hemophilia, and even though, you know, I don't have the degree or the license, I know more about it than you do, and we're not going to do this, you know? 
and they're, they're okay. not going to press too hard. They're not going to press too hard because they're they're going to be a little bit, you know, more nervous. I would suggest and 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 think that you know they realize you do know more about chemotherapy than I do, and uh, unless there's some life threatening situation, you know, and you would be considered a harm to yourself or to others that could be prevented in an emergency setting, then you know. Okay. That could happen as well. It depends upon the facts and circumstances, but yes, you could stop it. You know, if they want to give you a biological product versus, you know, recombinant, and you know, those are considerations that you should decide whether you want to or not allow that. Okay, I have two questions um, that kind of um, are connected regarding um, persuasion. The first one is. What do you do when you go into the emergency department and they pressure you to sign paperwork and don't give you time to think about things? You just remember what you've you know heard here and remember what your rights are and what their obligations are and their obligation is not to pressure you and your right is not to be pressured and you just tell them you know time out hold the phone whatever you know, I don't understand this. I have questions, you know, before I'm going to agree to this. And if you continue to get pressured and you don't feel like it's an emergency situation that you're not going to be harmed by not having or agreeing to do something, that's your right to go to perhaps a more appropriate provider or facility. Okay. Another related question is, who is typically asking for your participation in a research or clinical study? Because it's awfully hard to question participation when it's your hemophilia nurse or your doctor that you depend on if that's the person asking the question. So I guess how do you tell your hemophilia nurse or your hematologist no if they are the ones asking you to participate in a clinical study or research study? That that can be difficult, and I can appreciate, you know, how one would not want to uh, please the person who they've developed a relationship with, who is their primary care person for this particular situation. But ultimately, you know, you have to be the driver and, you know, pilot of your own ship. And ultimately, if you can't ask questions and if you can't feel comfortable in discussing this with your doctor, then the relationship, I think, has some questions uh, to be considered. And uh, I would just say, you know, be upfront, be honest, you know, and you should feel and be able to answer, ask questions and have answers comfortably without feeling pressured. Okay. And if you really feel like you're being pressured, say, I feel like I'm being pressured. No offense, but I do feel that way. And maybe it'll just kind of stop them from, you know, their automatic pursuit of something, and they'll really think about it, you know, maybe that'll be all that's necessary to kind of bring it down to the level that it's supposed to be on. Okay. And, of course, these now, are just suggestions. You know, I, this, you know, I haven't been in those situations necessarily, but I, this is what I would suggest that I might do. A related question is, how do I know if a clinical trial is safe? Um, they asked me to join one at my HTC, and I felt pressured. But I guess the person wanted some assurance that it was safe. How does one find out if a clinical trial is safe? Uh, I don't know. I think I would go back to the basics. And again, as we discussed, uh, you should know about it in advance. You should have time to do some research. We all have so much at our fingertips with the Internet. And, um, you know, there should be much information available as to what one can expect, foreseeable risk, material risks, uh, all deal with safety, and maybe the record of the company or the researcher may uh, be talked about or available online. Just those things. It's, it's do your homework, do your preparation, and it's up to you to feel safe and comfortable. You know, and you should be able to ask the questions to reach that point. If you don't reach that point, you shouldn't consent to the trial of the uh, research. Okay. Do children have a right to informed consent? <laughs> uh, yes, but a little bit different nuance there. Children, minors, in 
all states, I believe now, persons who are under the age of 18 do not have legal or what we call in the law contractual capacity. So the health care provider or the doctor who is proposing to treat or even in a research or a clinical trial situation, they can't get a valid bonding agreement from a child because the child doesn't have the ability under the law to consent legally. The parent is the one who would be authorizing the treatment or the research trial or whatever. However, I believe that most standards of care with regard to research clinical trials and even treatment in, in a hospital setting, in an HTC setting, in a doctor's office, depending upon the age of the child, the maturity, the education, the intellect, uh, I, I think it's recommended that you want to have the buy-in or as opposed to informed consent, some uh, hospitals and some uh, standards use the word assent, the assent of the child uh, to the treatment. Uh, I'm sure that if you ask any uh, young child uh, whether they want to have a needle stuck into them and have this infusion, they're going to tell you no, that's not going to govern. But, you know, an older child, a teenager or whatever, who's going to be participating in a clinical research trial or such, uh, or even in the medical setting, they need to be told. They, they're not just uh, specimens that are hanging around in there and mom and dad, you know, are going to make the decision. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it takes everybody's participation. Okay. And our last question, do I have the right to agree to parts of a study? Um, as in, I guess, maybe not the full study, but to um, portions of it. Um, for instance, I would like to agree to give samples of my child's blood for my doctor's personal research, but what assurances do I have that those samples are not being shared with other labs or in other studies? Well, the devil's in the details there, and uh, I don't think you have a right to do part or the whole. I think it depends upon what is being offered. If the clinical trial or the research study says that we, you know, allow participation in these areas and you don't have to participate in these areas, it's basically they set the rules for their study and it's up to the participant or the subject to decide whether or not this is something that they can agree to. Um, those are the questions that have to be asked, number one. And number two, anything that's of concern to you that you don't quite understand or that they're written documents and contracts, et cetera, spell out, I always say supplement something with, you know, uh, an email or something in writing that says, you know, uh, in English, for example, I have been advised and let them, you know, tell you, yeah, you do have the right to direct where and where not you know, this is going to happen or there, this is going to go. So you want to memorialize yeah, yeah. earlier. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We in the law, we, all, we do things all the time. You know, this is to confirm our conversation over the telephone where we both agree to such and such. If you disagree, you know, respond to whatever. The written, the written, you know, proof is always going to, you know, be good. And just because there's something that's, you know, in a printed contract doesn't mean that it can't have, you know, some interpretations or some specifications or some explanations that can't be added to it. And if something that you do write, this is a, a follow-up to this conversation, if something that you do write or memorialize, um, if it is not honored, what is the first Step that you should take. Let's say, for instance, someone did allow for a portion of, um, you know, they participated in a portion of a research study. They memorialized in writing what they were willing to do, but they found out that that is not what was honored. What should be the first step they should take? Well, from a legal standpoint, you're describing what I would call a breach of contract. It's basically breaking the agreement, number one. So you may need to take legal action depending upon the circumstances and, you know, uh, whether they're damages and what the, you know, the result of that is. Number one. Number two, I would suggest that you contact the uh, board or the commission who licenses or governs the researcher, you know, if it's uh, 
a physician, you know, the state medical society, the um, certification board, if it's, you know, the American Board of such and such or the American College of such and such, they all have ethical standards. You want to make a, a report or a complaint. If it's a hospital setting, you know, there are different things. There's the Joint Commission, JCO, that governs and regulates what happens in hospitals. There's a whole bunch of governing and professional organizations that you would want to contact as well as the sponsor, the funder, uh, the, you know, the people who are putting this thing on. But you All also right. have a legal issue. Okay. And we'll end it there. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, thank you all for the great questions. Uh, this concludes the webinar on informed consent, what did I agree to? Please contact the Hemophilia Federation of America for additional information on informed consent.